Um, so let's let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, morning, evening to everybody on the call today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping first and foremost. This uh, this webinar is going to be recorded in its entirety. So if um, if you have to jump off for any reason or if you want to watch it again, um, you can get access to that through our through our various uh, social channels um, after. So it'll be available there everywhere, uh, hopefully. Um, my name is Mark Armstrong. I um, head up our modern workplace team here at, here at Intech. Um, so I'm involved in kind of everything Microsoft um, across the business. So um, we're a Microsoft Gold partner and we can do everything from kind of implementing solutions like Teams, uh, everything from sort of implementing the hardware side of thing, the software side of thing through to um, change management and training. We look a lot at process automation through Power Automate. Um, app development through Power Apps, uh, cloud migration, so migrating applications into, into Azure, um, as well as files through SharePoint. And um, we do a lot of work improving company security posture, which is obviously what we're going to be um, talking about today. So without further ado, let's kind of move into the deck. Um, as an aside, if you've got any questions, if you could save those for the end. Um, so we're going to have a QA and a at the end of this session. Um, the plan is that you just raise your hand and then I'll unmute you and you can you can ask away. Um, you can also use the chat functionality as well to ask any questions on that and I'll try and get through as many as I possibly can at the at the end of the session. So the first thing we need to look at really is um, is, is stating the obvious. Um, a strong security posture is is critical. I think um, in particular, in this kind of new world that we find ourselves in now where lots of people are working in a hybrid manner, um, we've seen cyber attacks um, just go through the roof. Um, so I think they've more than doubled um, since since March 2020. And there's multiple reasons for that. But I think as much as anything, it's because we're not all in the office anymore. So um, when we come, when people are, um, you know, getting emails um, pertaining to be from the boss, it's not as easy for someone to just kind of shout across an office and say, you know, did you send me this? Um, so a lot of people are, are falling uh, prey to it in much more than they used to. I think these are some quite scary statistics. They are from a few years ago, but I think they've probably only ever gone up as opposed to gone down. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things is A, how quickly um, people can gain access to a system. So 87% of attacks took less than, took minutes or less um, to, to work. Um, but actually most of them aren't actually discovered for, for months. Um, so typically if I were um, someone looking to launch a phishing attack on a business, I'm not necessarily going to um, immediately make myself known when I join. I'm going to wait for a bit. I'm going to siphon off all the email and potentially all the data I possibly can over over many months um, to really maximise uh, my opportunity to extort money from a business. And, and that's what we see. So it's really important, um, obviously, that, that businesses have a really secure proposition. Sounds simple, but it's amazing how often it's not necessarily the case or you know, the security that's in there maybe isn't as, uh, as robust as it, as it could be. Um, the key security pains that we see um, across are things like, you know, how do I protect my employees from phishing attacks? So we're absolutely going to cover that today. Um, how do I enable a kind of a mobile and working from home workforce? I think that, um, again, we've seen this over the last 18 months, that there was a real scramble for businesses to enable their workers to be able to work outside the office. But I think as a result of that, what we've seen is that security um, wasn't considered as much. It was more just a case of, you know, let's get our staff need to access these files. And however we kind of activate that, let's just activate it and then we'll worry about everything else later. Um, and I think there's also a real concern amongst businesses, especially um, companies that still have a lot of their um, uh, kind of architecture on premise is, um, is the security implications of potentially moving their files into the cloud. And what that means, um, you know, are you giving the keys to the to the business to all of your staff? Um, are you giving them the ability to download all of their files from SharePoint and OneDrive directly onto their computer? So we'll look at that um, in relation to kind of what you are and you aren't giving them. Um, how do I give employees the right to right access while keeping hackers at bay? We'll absolutely look at that. And uh, and finally, how do I safeguard confidential business data? Um, so we'll be looking at all these factors and all these security pain points and they absolutely can be answered. Now, we're a Microsoft Gold partner, so naturally I'm going to be looking at kind of Microsoft solutions on here, but it's not it's not just the, um, the remit of Microsoft to kind of cover these areas. Um, so there's three um, 
kind of main subject headings that we're going to look at today. We're going to cover cyber attacks themselves. So we're going to look at the most common attacks, um, what they look like, what they can do, um, how, to, how to avoid them. We're going to look at how you can uh, mitigate risk. So some really um, easy measures that you can put in place very quickly, um, both as a business and as a um, kind of a personal user um, to mitigate your risk against these. And then um, further technologies that you might want to consider uh, implementing to um, to further enhance your your security posture. So the first area we're going to look at is um, is cyber attacks, and then particularly we're going to focus on kind of these four main areas. So we're going to look at um, phishing attacks and what they are. I'm sure we've kind of all heard of at least heard of a phishing attack, if not, if not necessarily uh, fully understand what it is. Um, social engineering, uh, ransomware, and brute force. Now the the source of most attacks these days is phishing. And these kind of lead on to these other areas, social engineering, et cetera. Um, but we'll cover all of these and give you kind of a, an overview as to, as to what to look out for, what it is, um, and how we can how we can um, fend against it. So phishing attacks are far and away the most common method that um, cyber criminals use to gain access to people's networks. And they come in many forms, um, but predominantly email. But I think the first thing that we're we're always keen to mention is it doesn't have to be email. Um, we're seeing more and more um, attacks taking place um, through through WhatsApp and through social media because I think people are maybe getting a little bit used to it from an email perspective, depending on how sophisticated the um, the email is. Um, but less so um, when when they're getting messages via via text um, or via uh, via WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever else. I am sure everybody. On this call has had at least one text um, um, in the last 12 months saying that they'd missed a parcel delivery and to, to click on a link to to rebook it and those are those, for me it's, it's quite a genius because yeah I, I think most more, more days than not something's getting delivered here so it's very easy for me to think all oh, right I missed that Royal Mail delivery I'll click on this link I only have to pay two pound and then and get it done but people are less are less um, kind of tuned into that sort of stuff but it's absolutely key to um to spot it. So really simple rules um, that you should immediately look into. So obviously not trusting um, unsolicited emails. Um, I think um, double and triple checking the sender's email address is key. So it's looking for um, for the obvious first and foremost. So does the name match the email address? Um, is it a corporate address or is it a hotmail address or a gmail address or something like that? That's really obvious, but if it's a more sophisticated attack, then it'll be a much more sophisticated email address. So it might look identical, but actually what they've done is they've replaced an I with a one um, or something like that. And, and so they own that domain. And so it's very similar to your, maybe your corporate domain, but it's not the same thing. Um, so it's absolutely crucial that you check these things. And I think um, when it comes to kind of sending funds, especially in particular, you'll never do that. Never trust an email. I would always be, you know, calling up the person that sent me that message and, and checking with them verbally. And again, I think this is why attacks have been more prevalent over the last 12 months as people haven't had it as easy to be able to do that. It hasn't been a case that I can walk across to someone's office or shout across them and say, you know, did you send me this? So yes, some people will then pick up the phone and, and, and make that check, but more and more, people aren't. They're kind of looking at it and going, well, it looks okay. And it sounds like that person, they've got the same email footer, their email address looks the same. Uh, I'll send it. Um, so really important that you do those checks. If we look at kind of a classic um, phishing uh, email, they they tend to always have these kind of four, um, these four areas that they, that they focus on. So the first thing is to create urgency. Um, so the whole point of this is you, to make that person panic and make that person think, oh my goodness, I've got to get this um, this thing paid or this this issue resolved immediately. Um, so if this is something personal, it might be that you know you you've, you've dipped into your overdraft limit, or you know if you don't answer this today, we're going to take you to court or something of that ilk. Um, if it's a business use, then again, it will be you know someone saying you know we need to get this bill paid today for for whatever reason so the first thing that will always be is create that urgency to make people kind of not think um enough and just kind of just think well i just need to get this out of the way i'll i'll, I'll get it paid they're always going to be um asking for personal information so the key to a phishing attack nine times out of ten um is to either get you to send money um directly or to steal your credentials 
So the easiest way to steal credentials is to create a URL that you click on. So you click on that. So this might be an email just saying like you need to change your password. Um, it's, it's out of date, whatever else. So you click on that link. Let's assume you're a Microsoft user. That takes you to a page that looks like the Microsoft um, reset password page. So you log in through that and you reset your password um, through that. Obviously, it's not. Um, the whole point of that is that now you've just given away your email address and your password to um, whoever ultimately uh, owns that particular site. Um, and those links will always be disguised. So as we can see here, it's always a click here, uh, you know, a, um, a hyperlink embedded within a word. But it, so the first thing you always need to be doing with these is just hovering over them and actually seeing, well, is this actually the URL that I'm expecting? Is this taking me to a Microsoft site? Is this taking me to my bank? Or is it taking me somewhere else? The important thing with any URL is it doesn't matter. It's where the last.com is. That's what makes the domain. So in this instance, I'm not going to yourbank.com. So let's say this was natwest.com. I'm actually going to this URL as a whole here, which is nothing like that. Um, so just simple things like that, just double and triple checking that links are what they're meant to be, emails are what they're meant to be, um, absolutely key. The other kind of um, key um, identifier of a lot of phishing attacks, certainly the less sophisticated ones, is just like just um, issues with spelling and grammar. So there might be a lot of use of international um, spellings, things like the lack of personalization in the email is always quite a key one. Um, international numbers where it should be a, a, a UK number if you're based in the UK or wherever you might be based, that's not a local number. Um, all kind of um, really easy things um, to pick up on. But if we look at the more sophisticated types of um, phishing attacks, so there's lots. Um, so there's anything from kind of email phishing, which we all probably get, you know, tens, if not hundreds of um, every, every day, um, where it'll just be someone pretending to be a legitimate um, organization or a legitimate person trying to steal your information. So that might be like the example before, someone trying to get you to log into the bank, um, someone trying to log into the Microsoft account. Um, more and more we're seeing links disguised as um, like SharePoint um, file shares and OneDrive file shares and things like that, because that's the sort of thing that more and more people are, are doing on a daily basis. So it's very easy to look at that and go, oh, well, such and such just tried to share a file with me. I'll, I'll click on that to, to open it up. All right, I have to sign in. Okay, I'll sign in. And again, it's it's not and you're in. They're not so sophisticated. These, the, the further you go down the chain, the more sophisticated things get. So if we look at spear phishing, um, these are phishing attacks that are much more personalized. So this is where someone has gained some information about you. Um, predominantly because they've looked at a LinkedIn profile or looked at social media or something like that. So they know a bit more about you. And so therefore they can say, right, well, I'm pretty sure this person probably reports to this other person um, in their business based on what LinkedIn tells me. So I'm going to address it from that person or I'm going to spoof that person's email so it makes it look like they're getting it from that person. Um, clone phishing. Um, again, is where an email is basically intercepted and then um, replicated. Um, but with links taken out and new links put in that are malicious um, or dangerous or attachments put in that are equally malicious or dangerous that might recruit malware so that they can install um, a virus on your, on your system or a, um, a, a gate, an entryway into your system. And then we've got whaling, which is essentially a, a form of spear phishing, I guess, but whaling where people deliberately target um, high ranking executives. Um, to because the kind of the, the focus being well, if anyone's got the keys to the to the kingdom money wise, it's going to be um, someone high up within the business. So that's the kind of person I want to be targeting, um, so that I can I can steal money off them. And um, and we see it all the time. And these attacks are getting more and more sophisticated. Social engineering um, is something that from a whaling fishing attack is kind of where it all comes from. So. Social engineering, as you can see from this slide, is where the social engineer will gather information about the victims. Um, so as I say, that might be LinkedIn, that might be through Facebook, it might be through all of the above. It might be because they've already kind of hacked into that person's email. So they're now reading that person's email. Um, a key thing to look at and a key thing to check every so often is where you, what your email forwards um, look like. One of the most common things that we see is um, that someone's maybe been hacked two or three months ago. Remember the first slide where it's months often before people reach, someone realizes they've been um, breached and there's been forward set up. 
And those forwards might just say, right, well, every time an email comes in or an email gets sent out with the word accounts in it, send it to this Gmail address. And it's that Gmail address that the hacker has control of. And by doing that, they can spend many months kind of gleaning, right, who, who, does, this, who does this company pay? How much do they typically pay them? As well as getting all those contact information, all those email footers, all that information, so they can put together a really legitimate um, uh, bit of fraud um, further down the line. Now, what we see with the social engineering perspective is once that's been done, that person will then pose as a legitimate person and often build up trust. So it's often not the case that the first message is, the, is going kind of straight for the kill. And that the first message is going to be one, the one with all the urgency and the one with all the links. Um, the first one might be something very innocuous just to kind of gain someone's trust. And we see this specifically um, when people are using um, something outside of, of email as their main comms um, method. So we've worked with companies um, who've seen this a lot from WhatsApp. So we had a, um, a client, um, for example, who one day just got, a, um, got an email out of the blue um, just saying from the FD saying, oh, I've changed my, I've changed my mobile phone number. It's now this. And that was it. That was the email. And then about five minutes later, they got a message from that new number um, saying, you know, hi, how are you doing? So this was to the MD. So the MD sees that and just replies going, yeah, yeah, all good. And that was literally it. And the, the MD thinks, oh, well, obviously I've got that email from the FD saying that I was, was going to change the number. He's now messaged me on WhatsApp. So I'll, I'll save that as my contact. And that's my new contact for the FD. And that was all he heard for a few weeks. Then he gets another message, um, something similar, just say, you know, again, just kind of just chatting, um, nothing innocuous. Another few weeks go by and then that's when the attack comes. So at this point, the person pretending to be the FD sends another message through WhatsApp saying, really urgent, we need you to release, um, send £2,200, I think it was, to this, um, to this account. Um, and it needs to happen now. And the person just did it. Now, it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it could have been. But the point was that because it hadn't just the person hadn't just gone in for the kill, they knew who this person, they knew who the FD was, they knew who the MD was. They had um, engineered it so that there was trust involved and that people there was no there was nothing to make that person particularly suspicious. That money got sent and it was and it was lost. Um, and we see this more and more. So when it comes to things like social engineering, there's an amount that you can do from a security perspective to harden your environment so that they can't, you know, hack into your emails and, and whatever else. But it's also just around just being super, super vigilant. Um, and as I say, when it comes to money being sent, really important that not, that's never done um, unless you've kind of had verbal, verbal confirmation that it's happened, that, that to do it off the person that is saying that they have to do it. Um, the, another really common form of attack is, is ransomware. So as you can see from this slide, every 11 seconds an organization falls victim to a ransomware attack. And we've all heard about them, whether it be um, the WannaCry attack on the NHS a few years ago. Um, there was a one um, a pipeline, the main I think, gas pipeline in the US um, on the East Coast uh, a few months ago was hacked and shut down. Um, ransomware attacks occur because someone gets access to the company network and that might be because they get in, you know, they get into a password breach or because someone um, clicks on a malicious link that downloads some malware onto a device and therefore installs the, installs the ransomware and locks someone out. And once that person is, is locked out or the company is locked out of their, of their files, it's very difficult to kind of break, break free of that um, without paying the criminal. But the point of people being criminals is that payment is by no means a guarantee that you'll actually um, ever see your money. And so it's absolutely critical um, that businesses uh, mitigate for this risk. So in the um, in the example of the, the pipeline that was that was hacked, that happened because the one of the, the person that happened to have access to a lot of the key systems used the same password across multiple accounts. So that password got compromised um, as, a, as part of a security breach. Um, on one of the um, on one of the you know the businesses that they used the, um, the the same email and password for, so that password then got sold on uh, via the dark web, and then someone tried it with their corporate account and it worked, and they got in and they locked them out, caused a rush on um, on gas in the in the US, so petrol, um, 
and caused obviously huge issues and huge reputational damage to that business. With the NHS example, that was um, that was software that um, that took advantage of a, a security of uh, a lack of updates on on Windows XP, I think it was, and again lost all that corporate data. Ransomware attacks have become really popular, and they're really um, evil things. Um, the most common places to get attacked at the moment are hospitals, particularly in the US, because um, they don't have necessarily huge amount of security provision, but they have a huge amount to lose, um, you know, actual lives at stake um, if they do get hacked. So if they do get hacked, more often than not, they pay. Um, and the, the hackers know that because, you know, without that, um, many hospitals have been resorted to, kind of have had, had to resort to things like pen and paper to take medical records um, and to treat patients because they don't have access to the data anymore. So securing against that is around good password protection and all sorts of things that we're gonna look at in a, in a second, and just being um, vigilant. Now, there'll be a lot of people maybe on this call who think, well, I'm okay, I've backed up all my data um, somewhere else. So if we got ransomware, it wouldn't be great. It might destroy the particular device that gets hacked, but I'm not gonna lose my data. That's true. Um, but um, the, the one thing to consider is it's not just around you not being able to get your data back or in the, if you backed it up, being able to get your data back, um, but it's what that person then does with the data that they've now got hold of. They've got all of your corporate accounts and all of your corporate data, what's stopping them selling it um, to somebody else or making that available on the, on the dark web for purchase. Um, so getting a hack of this kind is, 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 is something you absolutely, um, you absolutely want to avoid. The final um, kind of form of attack that we'll look at is a, a super common one, um, or it certainly it was. Um, it's becoming less prevalent um, because it doesn't work as effectively as it used to, but it's still around and that's um, brute force attacks. Um, as you can see, there's been a 400% increase in brute force attacks over the, last, um, over the last 12 months or so, particularly in the remote desktop environments because of the prevalence of remote desktop environments in this, this kind of new world that we live in. Brute force attack is very, very simple. It is um, finding the least, um, the, the, the least secure part of the system and throwing thousands of passwords at it, at it a second till you break through. So on any kind of non-legacy system, brute force attacks don't really work because there's policies in place that you know, are very easily utilized to say, right, well, after five incorrect password attempts, that user's logged out. Um, but we find with the um, with legacy systems of which lots of companies still have lots of them hanging around, those sorts of protections aren't in place, and that's where brute force attacks can become can be very um, effective. The only way to kind of mitigate well, there's two ways to mitigate against the brute force attack. One is don't use old systems and make sure that you know everything that you're using is up to date. And secondary, you know, have have a good password and have other procedures in place beyond just a password. Um, so that these types of hacks um, don't work. So I think these are by far the easiest type of um, attack to mitigate against. It's, it's very much a technology thing and a password protection thing, um, but very much uh, useful to kind of be aware of. If we look at, um, therefore, how we're going to mitigate risk. So the most obvious thing to do to make your systems more secure is make sure that the passwords are up to, up to scratch. So here we have, um, the uh, top, the most popular passwords currently used in the world um, today, and there is um, they're incredibly secure, as you can see. Um, now, most people, I would hope, well, most people do, I guess, have these passwords. If they're the most popular, hopefully, no one on this uh, on this call today um, has these. But the most obvious thing to say is, well, obviously, this isn't the sort of password that you want to be um, uh, utilizing. There's lots of um, kind of standard advice that you'll see around how to create. Um, good solid passwords. So as we can see here, yeah, you know, it's using at least eight characters, it's using a variety of letters, um, upper and lower case, special characters, numbers, um, all of those things will absolutely make your password harder. We can then start going into even more levels of, of, of kind of, um, of, uh, of security. So we can avoid using real words. We can avoid um, I think people think they're being quite clever when they maybe instead of having their password be password, they think, oh, well, I'll make it. It's still going to be password, but I'll use an at symbol instead of an A. And I'll use a dollar sign instead of an S. But when we're looking at brute force attacks, these are the kind of passwords that are super, super common. 
So they all the sort of things that will be built into those attacks and the, the sorts of things that people kind of target um, very, very quickly. Um, the other kind of standard advice um, beyond just the strength of it is to not use the same password across multiple accounts. Um, because in the in, as we kind of talked about in the case of that US pipeline, um, that person wasn't breached because their password was guessed on that particular environment because it, their password was hacked in a different environment and they'd used it across lots of them. I think everybody is kind of guilty of this to one extent or another. Um, to mitigate against that, um, obviously having multiple passwords is great, but it can become really difficult to remember them. So again, I'd be staggered if there's not at least one person um, on this webinar today who doesn't have um, a little book of passwords. I hope they don't, but I bet someone does. Or, you know, their password's saved in their notes on their phone or something like that, because it's, it becomes more and more impossible if you're trying to try and follow all this best practice to, um, to remember anything. So this is kind of the standard advice, but it's not necessarily what we'd recommend anymore. Um, because as this, um, as this cartoon ably demonstrates, what we what we do when we um, when we create the our kind of new style passwords is we either still make them look like they're more complicated, but we still try and make them memorable to us um, so that we can still remember them. And actually, they're still infinitely hackable unless they're really long. Um, and and we've kind of got into this situation where we've. As, as, we, as we see here, where we've kind of trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for them to remember, but are actually really easy for computers to guess. So the new um, kind of strategy from a password protection state, uh, point of view um, is to um, use four random words, because what we find with that is four random words creates a password that is supremely difficult to crack. So as you can see here, it's, it would take 550 years for a, a bot to crack that at a thousand guesses a second. But actually, it's much easier for the human brain to remember. While this one is more difficult for the human brain to remember, and actually from a bot perspective, much easier to guess. Um, so the first bit of you know, practical advice that I give you with regards to password um, protection is think about this as a potential option for your passwords moving forward for random words. Um, it will make for a much more secure password, but something that's easy to remember. Now, obviously, a lot of um, uh, systems these days kind of demand that you must have an uppercase in there somewhere and a number in there somewhere and a special character in somewhere. But obviously, you can adapt these four, four words to do that. You know, a, a capital C at the start, maybe an exclamation mark at the end and a, a one in the middle or something like that um, to kind of get through those little, um, little uh, gates that they make you jump through. But ultimately, we see this is a much better way of doing it. Um, the other kind of advice that's coming out of Microsoft now around passwords in general is that you shouldn't necessarily have a policy to um, that people have to change their password every 30 days um, because that either means that it's even more difficult to remember because they're having to change it very often and human behavior kind of dictates that people don't want to make it harder for themselves. So what do they do? Well, if their password this week is Manchester 1, guess what their password when they next have to change it will be? It'll be Manchester 2. Um, and, you know, people uh, looking to hack a system know this. Um, so actually, it's more, it's better to have just one, you know, the person have a secure password for that particular system and never have to change it unless, obviously, it's, it's, it's breached and you see that, you see that happening. But if it is one of these passwords, then it's highly, highly unlikely, nearly impossible um, that it will. Now, when it comes to using multiple passwords across multiple sites, it absolutely is the best policy. But again, we were up against this roadblock of that being very difficult to remember. Um, so the things that we'd recommend is that you use some sort of password manager to do that. Um, so LastPass is something that we recommend. It's free for, um, for personal use, or you can use your browser to do it. So if you've created an account with Microsoft or with Google, whoever your browser of choice is, then you have that, you use that as your password manager. As long as what you can basically do is that you make sure that the password to get into that password manager is very strong, i.e. Four, four random words, and then you have it create your passwords moving forward. So it can create very strong, completely indecipherable passwords for all of your various accounts that you don't know, um, never mind the hackers know, um, but it's all gatewayed by the one that you do know. So therefore, you only have to remember one password, but you can get into everything and you can be absolutely sure that everything's got a different password and it's all very, very secure. Um, 
I'm conscious of time, so I'll run through this kind of signing in our public device bit of advice as well. Um, so again, we're seeing more and more businesses move into the cloud, and that's great. Um, but it comes with security risks. And one of them is, well, what are you doing? What do you do if you have to sign in um, publicly? Or if they have to work from a public space? Um, so I think the first bit of advice that I want to give is that I should, I, it shouldn't be necessary to say, well, you just can't do it. Um, I think one of the major advantages of having files in the cloud, being able to work in this kind of cloud-based environment is that you do have access to your work life wherever you happen to be so that you can pick up emails if you need to. You can access and edit documents and do whatever you need to do to kind of get things uh, done. But if you do have to work from an internet cafe, they, if they exist anymore, um, or from a PC that's not yours, just some really um, common um, little bits of advice that I give you. I'd say always use an incognito browser. Therefore, you don't have to remember to sign out of anything. You just have to remember to shut the browser down when you're finished so that you're not leaving your credentials um, on the computer for someone else to find and utilize. Um, make sure if MFA is enabled, and we're going to look at what MFA is in just a sec, it will always be required um, through this method because you're going in incognito, but you absolutely want that to be the case. You want to have to jump through that extra hoop so that you know you're not being compromised. Always close the browser after use so that, again, you, you know, you're not leaving anything up for anyone else to get aware, get their hands on. And be aware of your surroundings. Um, we're seeing more and more common things around people kind of shoulder surfing and watching someone when they put a password in um, and, and things of that ilk. Um, or just watching over someone's screen and seeing what they're typing, if they're on the train or whatever else. So, again, just be aware of your surroundings and make sure that, um, you know, you're not going to be compromised in that way. All fairly straightforward advice at home. Um, so when it comes to implementations, we've kind of segmented this off into what we'd say would be high priority and, um, and then things to consider. So if we look at um, high priority, the absolute number one thing that we think every single company in the world should have as a matter of course is um, multi-factor authentication because it just adds uh, an extra layer of protection to the sign-in process without causing any real hassle from it for the staff um, or the user base but absolutely um, creating something that's much, much harder to hack, even if no one has followed that advice around not using the same password everywhere um, and anything else. At least it means that even if your users are still using pretty rubbish passwords, as an IT function, you've put this in place to mitigate for that um, and, and secure that environment. Um, Multi-factor, well, a factor firstly can be one of three things. So it's either something you know, like a password or a PIN number, um, something you are, so that's things like um, uh, biometrics, so iris scan, fingerprint scans, things like that, and, and also something you have, and that's maybe a mobile phone or a, um, a token or something of that ilk. So multi-factor, it basically says well, you've got to have two of these three things um, to log in. So in the future, um, I think this is definitely the way Microsoft want it to go, and I think it's the way everything will go, is that password, that something you know, will not be one of the factors. Um, ultimately, we want to move to kind of a passwordless uh, environment because passwords are the easiest thing to crack, much easier to crack, the, much harder to crack the other two, if not impossible, when it comes to the biometric side of things. Um, but we're not quite there yet. So typically what multi-factor will be is someone puts their password in and then the secondary factor is that something that they have. Um, so you can utilize this from a Microsoft perspective. So Microsoft have multi-factor um, built in. Um, you can see some um, tips going into the chat now and some links around what what, the, what that kind of look like. Um, or you can use third party solutions as well. But they tend to work in the same way that they'll send you either a push notification to confirm it's you. Um, that tends to be the easier thing. Or they can call you or they can send you a text message. The whole point is it just means that when you're logging in, not only do you have to know your password, but you have to have the phone. And that is going to stop 99% of attacks dead because the person is not going to have that, um, that thing. And it can be set so that it's of no real consequence to the user from a, from a hassle perspective. So you could, you could have it really secure and just say, well, every time someone ever logs in from anything, they have to do this. But you can also make it a little less stringent. So you can say, well, once they've signed in on a certain device, they don't have to do it again for 30 days on that particular device or 60 days or whatever you want. So you can make it so that it's not so intrusive from a, from a user's perspective to become irritating, um, but still gives a level, a really high level of security. 
So absolutely something that everybody could should consider. As a secondary um, kind of form of, uh, of security, um, working alongside multi-factor authentication, we thoroughly recommend conditional access. So what conditional access will do is it will look at the signals, i.e. how someone, what someone's doing to sign in, so who they are and where they are, what device they're using, um, what application they're using to sign in through, and, um, and what's kind of going on with their account at the time. So, and then basically determine whether they need they can have access based on these factors. So my multi-factor authentic, my policy might be that when every time someone logs in, they have to do multi-factor authentication unless they've used that device in the 30 days and they've already done it. In which case it would check, it would see that the user is used me. It would see that I'm using a device that I did multi-factor on 10 days ago. So that's fine. So it would just allow me access straight into my system. Alternatively, it might see that it's me, but it might not be that device I'm using. It might be a new device, one it doesn't recognize, in which case it does multi-factor to make sure it is me. If it is, I'll do it, fine, I'm in. If it's not me, person's not in. Um, when we're looking at applications, um, this is around kind of legacy application access in particular. So you can switch that off. Uh, a really common attack vector for hackers is to use um, uh, kind of web systems that don't have um, protection against things like uh, brute force attacks. So what you can do is you can tell your system, well, if any app, if anyone's trying to gain access to an application that allow essentially allows brute force attacks, just block access. Even if they get the password right, don't even let them get to multi-factor, just block it. Real-time risk will be all sorts of things, but one of the key ones is location. Um, so you might say, right, um, this person logged in five minutes ago from Manchester and we let them in because it was the we recognize the device they're in, but then five minutes later, they're trying to log in from Russia. That's impossible. Therefore, we're going to immediately ask them to, uh, for MFA, or maybe we're just going to block it. And equally, from a location perspective, you might think, well, we're going to blacklist certain locations dead. So we're not even going to bother with MFA. We're just going to say it's blocked. And that might be, again, you know, the common countries where cyber attacks tend to originate from, you might just block those outright equally might allow certain whitelist locations. So you might say if someone's logging in from the office, for example, and we know they're in the office because of their IP address, we, won't, we don't need MFA for that, we'll allow them access. So conditional access alongside multi-factor, again, further uh, mitigates risk with no real um, uh, infringement on kind of how the user can operate on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really, um, it's really a nice little system. When we look at kind of um, things to consider, the first one that we absolutely recommend that businesses look at is cyber essential certification. Um, chance of a cyber attack on a business reduces by at least 70% once they've enabled, once they've done the cyber essentials basics, which is a really inexpensive thing to do. Um, and it just looks at kind of all the things that we've kind of covered when it comes to mitigating risk essentially. Um, but really worthwhile looking at. That's something that we as a business can do um, for you. We can manage the whole process for you. There's, a, there's lots of other companies that can do that as well. But I thoroughly recommend, and we'll put some links in the, um, in the chat in a minute, um, that you look at Cyber Essential Certification. It's just about getting kind of the basics right, I guess, from a security perspective, but really, um, really useful things to do. Um, we can then look at how you can further protect business data. Um, so there's lots of things you can do, certainly within a Microsoft environment to further secure things. So that might be um, enabling things like encrypting um, sensitive emails end to end. Emails are really, uh, can be are fairly straightforward to intercept um, and more often than not aren't encrypted. Um, so forwarding them and things, um, people, you know, if someone again hacks into a system to set up an auto forward to get everything moving forward, um, end to end encryption is gonna deny a lot of that. Um, Blocking sharing of information like credit card numbers, so you can automate this. So the system looks out for someone sending a credit card number in a file or in, a, um, in an email or in a chat and, and stops it dead. And that can be anything. So it could be things that are specific to your business, as well as credit card numbers, passport numbers, driving license details, all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the really interesting things that I think is going to become really popular is the restricting the ability to copy and save um, business information outside of a corporate environment. Um, so there are ways and means that you can ring fence your data um, so that it can't be taken out. So that if I'm maybe a disgruntled salesperson and I think, well, I'm going to resign next week, but before I do, from home, I'm going to download all of my stuff that's in SharePoint and in OneDrive and throw it on it with a USB stick. I'll throw it just onto my personal PC on my hard drive so that I can utilize that 
um, when I when I join my new company. Um, so you can ring fence all that, so it's impossible to take out, so that the person can't save it onto the hard drive. They couldn't email it to themselves. They couldn't even copy and paste out of it into a non-secured document. It blocks the lot. Um, and also looking at cloud archiving. Um, so enable, archiving everything that comes through the cloud so that um, it, that comes through your system so that if you if you have um, a GDPR request or any sort of legal reason to kind of have to go back through time, you can access that. And obviously having backup as well, um, secondary backup in the cloud is really important um, because there's only so far that kind of any cloud protection goes out of the box. And again, it's going to protect you if you do fall victim to say a ransomware attack, then at least you're not going to lose all your data um, off, the, off the back of it. And then device management is the last thing that I think would be absolutely vital to look at. Um, so through mobile device management, you can put security policies in place that protect your data um, from, uh, from theft. And this is particularly kind of internal theft. Um, so what this allows you to do is put baselines in place to say, right, well, you know, you can access email on your phone, that's fine. Um, but to do that, you must have a pin on your phone and you must be running the latest version of iOS or Android because that's secure. And if you're not, you can't access the corporate data. So you have little gateways in that means that you know that wherever your device, wherever your kind of um, uh, company IP lives, it's protected. Um, and you then have the ability to remove it um, with selective wipe. So if a device is lost or stolen, in the click of a button, you can wipe it um, entirely, or you can do selective wipe to just remove corporate data from it. So if someone's been using their personal device to access company data and they resign, then in a click, um, you can remove the corporate stuff from the device or devices. So it might be a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a PC, whatever. Remove that without wiping uh, everything. So again, you always know where your data is, who's got access to it and, and how they're accessing it. And that, I'll take a breath, is our, um, is our, is our webinar. So um, more than happy to kind of open this up to questions if anybody's got any. So you can either um, feel free to either raise your hand and then we'll unmute you and, uh, and you can ask away or you can um, ask a question through the, um, through the chat if you like. Um, or um, I do have um, some questions that I got sent through to me um, pre pre this going live that I'm, I can I can run through instead. So I'll give everyone a second just to um, put the thing in caps on. And if not, well, one of the first things I'd like to kind of look at, one of the things that I was I was questioned around is kind of how much does all this stuff cost? Um, and the answer is not a lot, less than you'd think, actually. Um, so things like multi-factor and conditional access are, are, are really inexpensive. Um, if not bundled um, with um, with things that you already have. So if you're a Microsoft um, 365 user, if you've got um, if you've got licensing through Microsoft, then you can get multi-factor authentication through that um, for free. It just needs to be implemented. Um, we do use that. We also use a third-party service called Duo, which is paid for, but um, works in a slightly different way. Um, so the Microsoft MFA secures just Microsoft stuff. Um, something third-party like Duo secures everything, um, whether it be in the Microsoft um, kind of world or, or not. But that's free. Conditional access um, is, is, is inexpensive. And a lot of it is bundled within the new, newish uh, Microsoft 365 Business Premium. So when it comes to um, everything that we've talked about, actually, um, device management, um, protecting um, corporate data, uh, multi-factor conditional access, that's all bundled within Microsoft 365 Business Premium. So if you've already got that, you are already paying for this stuff. Um, it just needs to be um, set up. And that we're not talking, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds to do that. So I'd say implementing it is very cheap, certainly much cheaper than recovering from an attack. Um, and user impact is also uh, um, a really common thing that we get asked, you know, is this going to create a lot of hassle for our for our users? Are they going to be um, constantly um, forgetting their passwords now because they've set it to be super complex? Are they going to be constantly getting pings off their phone because of multi-factor? Um, are they constantly going to get locked out because conditional access policy doesn't like what they're doing? Um, the answer is no. Um, the user impact in general should be should be minimal. If it's implemented properly, um, which we could help you do, um, then the user should barely notice that anything's changed. 
they'll only really notice if um, if they're subjected to an attack in that it won't be successful or it's got a far less chance of being successful or if they're trying to do something they're not supposed to. So more often than not, users only know this sort of things in other than the ping every 30 days or whatever to do multi-factor. They only really notice if they're trying to do something that they shouldn't like taking a file out of the corporate, out of OneDrive or out of SharePoint and putting it on the hard drive or copying, pasting something away. Um, so yeah, user impact is, it, it can be, as managed properly, can be really um, low. Um, the other thing that we're asked, that I, I got questioned on was around kind of how Intact can work with businesses. Um, so the key for us is that we can work with you any way you want. So if you're a small, medium-sized organization with no IT department, then we can run the whole thing end to end. Um, we're not just an implementation business. Um, so it's not just the case that we'll just put a load of stuff in and say, right, off you go. Um, we'll work with you from, from the start to build a solution that works for you. Um, we'll build it, but then we'll train it out to businesses, uh, train it out to all the users, uh, provide you with lots of documentation, um, sending regular emails out to, to, to the user base to say, right, look, this is what's coming. This is what it's going to do. This is what to expect. So it's not a big shock for everyone. We do that whole change management piece. If you're a larger organization and you've got an IT department, then we'll work alongside the IT department. So we'll fill in the gaps um, and we're more than happy to kind of train up um, IT teams as we go along so they can become self-sufficient in, in whatever it is that we're implementing um, moving forward. So the point is we can be absolutely adaptable to whatever people um, want. Um, I've not seen any questions, that's fine. Um, I'm going to, you should have hopefully seen as we've gone through this, um, some useful links um, going into the uh, into the chat. Um, I recommend that you copy those uh, now because I don't think you'll have access to the chat when this webinar ends. I'm also going to put in right now my, my personal email address, or my business email address. Um, so if you want to email me directly, um, either because you've got a question around what we've talked about, you just want to have a, a chat about how we could potentially um, work together or what we do or any anything at all, feel free to email me directly and I'm more than happy to, to have a discussion kind of one on one um, about anything you want to discuss really um, in any way in which we can we can help you. And uh, and with that, I'm going to say thanks very much for joining. Thoroughly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. We're four minutes over, which for me is pretty good. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot.